Okay. Get connect to Welcome. We're going to look at a series of slides that I put together almost a decade ago that describe and visualize some of the things that I have typically observed or paid attention to during the lunar cycle Awakatsuki, so the deer moon. This is when all of the ungulates go into their rut and even though some might tra translate awakatsi as deer, um, it, it actually is describing those ungulates in, in general, including white-tailed deer, mule deer, antelope, moose, elk. Um, I don't think you'd count e ni in a Blackfoot sense, the bison under this category but all of those other ungulates. Any case, um, let's get into it and we'll see how much has changed in the last decade. This is Shpopikimi, where I do most of my nature studies, or have for the past, you know, 20 years or so. Little Oxbow, off of the Old Man River, on the downstream end of Sekukkotok, let's Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, this place has been levied in <laughs> to create a kind of wetlands, as you see here. Uh, this year, although the foliage looked still much like this going into the lunar cycle, the water does not. It's very low this year. And uh, I've seen years when it's very high, years when it's very low. This year and last year, the lowest that I've ever seen it. Um, but the picture shows what it looked like almost a decade ago. And uh, the foliage, the kind of the, the coloration that you see here is what I associate with this this going into this lunar cycle, the kind of the, the lay of the landscape and the look of it, you know. A lot of animals are still up and around, including the cold-blooded. Spoke B, the painted turtle here, you can see basking. Um, you can routinely see these basking even uh, as it gets fairly cold at Spoke B. Kimi. This is the animal that I kind of gave the name, my name, to this place after the turtle waters. But they'll still be up and around. Soon though, soon though, they'll be going under under the mud. Once the ice is over, they're under. And the young of this year that should have hatched even a whole lunar cycle ago, uh, will remain in their underground nests where the eggs were laid up on shore uh, through the winter. Those that haven't been predated this year, uh, something's gone through, probably a skunk or a raccoon, and dug up a lot of the nests. But always some survive. In any case, the cold-blooded are still up and about. The leaves going into the lunar cycle are beginning to turn. You're seeing a little bit of golden color here and there, typically. This year, the, the, the moon came in a little bit late because we're having a 13 moon uh, cycle. And this is always the last lunar cycle of summer. And so things in the trees had changed a little bit more golden, but... Um, not a lot compared to this photo of 10 years ago. You can see golden patches on the wet meadows there. What do you think those are? Pause the video if you'd like. Inaksapis, the dog bane, the little rope, Indian hemp. This is one of these kind of plants that in certain seasons, at least, you should be able to identify at a, at a fair distance. Nuxop is the dog bane. It's got red skin, 
and these trident uh, kind of what would they call it opposite uh, branching but I, I kind of see it look like a trident with red skin and as this dries up when we get more into the midwinter um, these will be harvested for their fibers so they're turning gold there's still some flowering going on if you're in the right places uh, this would be uh, red tea and blackfoot which is common tick seed sorry my uh, writing doesn't seem to be fitting into the uh, quick time video capture here but it's called amoxikimi red tea or common tick seed in english and it grows in clay places and this is one of the medicinal plants um, in the blackfoot world it's a uh, something that's used as a as a general tonic for your system when you're feeling bad but it's also mixed with a lot of specialized medicines you'll also bump into otskapis the the blue flower otskapis the showy aster still blooming although coming to its end in the uh, river bottoms you'll see the western clematis remaining in seed at this point um, leaves will start turning and drying among the berries meeks in it seem are heavy on the branches in other years this particular year at Shpopikimi uh, the city did something, I believe. Some kind of um, insecticide must have been utilized because the insects were very few and therefore um, the birds were affected and those birds that could rely on berries as well as um, proteins we're harvesting all the berries that existed and so uh, except for going outside of the city I'm not going to get any of these berries this year but until a frost it's not time to harvest them anyway so I leave them be you may get the first frosts during this lunar cycle and uh, if you can hold on to the end of this branch and just tap the branch and berries fall then it's it's ready to go uh, but I'll explain harvesting of this in the next lunar cycle here's the round leaf hawthorn a plant that in Blackfoot is probably called guinea the same as the rose our various roses and indeed it is basically a rose hip um, of sorts but hawthorn is known especially to be helpful medicinally for the cardiovascular system and so my understanding is that it can um, thicken the walls of veins and arteries um, while not narrowing them but making them uh, less susceptible uh, to to breakage um, at the same time there's there's a widening effect that goes on um, allowing more blood to flow and I, I believe you're supposed to microdose on these long term to get this kind of, of effect in your system I would have loved to have collect a whole year's worth of these berries this year uh, from the patches that I know here in Sikukotok, but again because of the uh, Insect repellents, I believe um, These berries are all harvested by the birds you Still should have some choke cherries So in a in a nice year uh, During this time you might be able to get some choke cherries and some bullberries together 
Um, there might still be some insects about. Here's a pink edge sulfur, one of our butterflies. And they'll be still mating this time of year. In this lunar cycle. I see a lot of um, I see a lot of butterfly larvae crossing the trails looking for places where they're going to hibernate for winter. Uh, at the warmer beginning of the sea of the lunar cycle, you'll still have some of the uh, grigs and some of the dragonflies about. So this is a paddle-tailed darner, pretty much the largest dragonfly in my area. Sphinx or Sphex thread-waisted wasp. Uh, one of the one of the wasps that will still be visiting flowers, and it's visiting the tufted white prairie aster. By the way. Another uh, late insect that's, that's contributing to the pollination of this flower is the drone fly. You know, everybody thinks just bees. Oh, if we lose, if we lose the, the European honeybee, we're in trouble. Well, there was a lot going on here before the European honeybee. Um, you know. But anyway, drone flies, and th these guys are going to hibernate. If you watch my winter lectures in phenology, you'll you'll see where and how they do it. Um, back to flowers again. We got the tufted white prairie aster. Uh, you're going to see red guinea, the rose hips that I was just talking about, and we have three species of rose in addition to the hawthorn. So uh, the most common at my site is the prickly rose, uh, but this one happens to be the prairie rose, which is a low-growing species, and there's also the Canada rose. In season for harvest this time of year is Otsutsiman, the ball cactus berry. And in fact, just tomorrow morning, I'm planning to do a little walk and talk with a couple of my uh, students I do walking talks every Sunday morning in Lethbridge, by the way. Uh, you're welcome to join one if you'd like to. Uh, a financial donation <laughs> is expected. Uh, most of my students pay about $20 per walk, and the walk goes an hour and a half to two hours. Most of the times we're at Elizabeth Hall Wetlands. In the winters, we meet at 8 o'clock in the morning. In the summers, we meet at 7.30 in the morning. Um, but tomorrow, we're meeting in a different location. Tomorrow's Sunday morning for me, and I'm meeting in a different location to go harvest this, Utstatsiman, the ball cactus, which has a berry um, that's kind of like, a, in my opinion, it's like a, a cross between a fig and a grape. It's full of tiny little seeds, um, but it's got a sweet taste and a kind of a grape-like skin on it. And when it's ripe, you don't even have to pull it. You just touch it with your finger and it'll fall out of the cactus. My uh, harvest ethics for this plant, for most plants, but, uh, I just tell you for this one, for now, is that I don't pick any berries from the first cactus that I come across. If I find, if I come across cactus with berries, I just let it pass. When I come to a second plant that has berries, I'll harvest up to half of its berries. No more than half. And I'll leave it. If I come to a plant that has been being harvested by some other being, human or otherwise, or what have you, I won't touch it. I'll leave it alone. I'll consider that their plant. So that's basically my ethics, and I think it works out.
Doesn't seem like a lot of other animals are interested in Otsutatsuman, though. However, the rodents really like Otakotsis, the, the prickly pear. And they seem to, they like the seeds in particular. So they work these fruits off, and I start finding these fruits during this lunar cycle and on into the first couple of cycles of winter, I'll find these prickly pear fruits pulled off the cacti, opened up, spread, seeds spread out, and some of them, you know, gnawed on by the rodents. This is the appearance of Achso, oh, the wild licorice during this lunar cycle. It's got its orange tinged burrs with seeds encased which the field mice and shrews and such are going to become keenly interested in in the moons to come watch for that harvest you're also going to see a lot of animals interested in the sunflowers not though sapis get see to me this word is literally sunflower and is a transliteration of the English. I don't know what the original Blackfoot word was, whether it was this or something else, but this is the contemporary word used, not only for the prairie sunflower, but for the rhombic leaf sunflower, which is our other indigenous species in my area, and really any sunflower. Not though sapis tiskits is the literal translation or transliteration. In my harvest experience, if you want to try to get some of the protein out of these flowers, what you do is you clip the stem a ways off from the seed head and you gather a, a, a bundle, you know, maybe 20 flower heads together in a small brown paper bag, tie them up and let the seeds dry out and rain. You just have to tap or rattle the bag to really get them loose. If you want to go for a larger harvest, I've even like cut off a bunch of the heads and just put a whole bunch of heads in a brown paper bag together and let them dry out and then shake them all up and then extract the heads and what you get is a mixture of seed and a little bit of husk material, like paperish husk material. The seed, the seed uh, itself is encased in a hard husk, which you're not going to get rid of in these local flowers. You just got to eat them for the roughage and all. Um, it's not like spit. <laughs> but if you have larger garden flowers, you know, they're still not this is the season when you can start really um, cutting them off, drying them off, harvesting them. Uh, some of the animals are interested in this seed, Oniki uh, Sakimskan, and the Blackfoot, I'm not entirely sure of the translation. Oniki is milk. Skan is a is 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 acquired. Speaking to having been acquired, Sakimps. I don't know. Oniki Sakimpskan. It might be another just English transliteration of milk weed. I'm not sure. I don't want to. I don't want to try to vouch for this as old Blackfoot at all. But it is the current use Blackfoot for showy milkweed, whose seed pods uh, open up like like the the plant from uh, what do you call it? Feed me Seymour. Uh, what do you call that? I don't know. I don't know what that movie was or that or that play, but they open up like alien pods, toothed and all, and uh, it's it's beautiful. And they and they send their seeds forth, and 
some of them are harvested even before they open up by local rodents. You can see uh, seed pods here that have been chewed open and their seeds extracted. Um, this plant, of course, is crucial in my area for the northern oriole that uses the, the hemp, the, the fiber from this plant, as the key ingredient in its nesting material. But in most places south of where I'm at, uh, this plant is known primarily for its association with monarch butterflies. The monarch can only lay its eggs on this plant and its larva can only eat off and mature from the flesh of this plant. So it's, it's very important to the monarch butterflies, but here in Lethbridge, we really don't get many cases of monarchs. I've only seen one in about two decades of surveying wildlife at Shpopikimi. One of the berries that's coming into season in this lunar cycle is Upsi. Some people call it Gupsi. I don't know why they why they add a little g at the beginning, but it's it's, it's supposed to talk about the white berry up. It should even be a double A Upsi. Whiteberry or Mississippi soys, the shit willow. And that again comes from the Nopi story. If you've heard my earlier lectures, you know about this plant already. But when we start getting our frosts and such, these winter berries start getting ripe. And if you want to harvest wolf willow for taste, uh, if you get it after the first few freezes, that's really when it's best. If you want it for seed, um, you know, it's, it's already prepared for that. If you want it for uh, uses of tanning for guts and that kind of thing, you can already harvest it. But if you, if you want it for taste, let it ripen. It's a winter berry. Uh, we have more winter berries than summer berries, to tell you the truth. One of the really, uh, like, coolest caterpillars I've ever found eats off of the leaves of Mississippi, so these are Gupsi or whatever you want to call it, with willow. Um, it looks like a braid of leather doesn't it? I'm not sure what moth or butterfly this becomes, but it's quite beautiful. I see it here and there. It's spooky to me on these plants. I've never tried to capture it and grow it, which would be what, what I think uh, the easiest technique for learning what it becomes, but I'll get there. This lunar cycle itself is named after the deer. Awakatsiks. Awakatsiki, some of the deer moon. And included in that, of course, the white tail. Awatoi. Awatoi is speaking about the tail wagging. Okay? And here you see at Shpopikimi a white tailed deer in its rut during this lunar cycle. Its mouth is open, its uh, tongue is wagging, you know, its tail is looking funky. <laughs> These deer, uh, they kind of they lose their stuff in this lunar cycle along with a lot of them. This is Isikotoi. The black tail, sick, meaning black, awat, awat, 
Neither waving, waving tail, black tail. Isiko toi. And you can see, you can see their bucks during this season. Yeah, it's time. This is their time. This is their rep. If you go up toward the mountains, you'll hear the, the elk, no doubt. Um, all of the ungulates are getting there right on. In snake territory, you have the birth of neonates. And I've learned that in some summers, uh, you might have the birth of neonates appear earlier in a summer moon that only occurs on occasion that might be called when the snakes are blind. And it's it's almost like a samatsi or a samatsuki sum in the winter. Um, the 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 unpredictable moon. It's like the unpredictable moon of summer. And you have the baby snakes. So they do come typically during the last lunar cycle, but if you're in a lunar if you're in a moon where there's a um, these snakes come in the lunar cycle that's earlier than this, the newborns. Anyway, here you see a, uh, a wandering garter, newborn, neonate, the Blackfoot term for these snakes is pitsiksine, and there used to be a, uh, a hibernacula of wandering garter snakes at Spobikimi, but they moved. I did find their relocation uh, uh, place. It's not too far upriver. We also have at Spopikimi bits, uh, also bits, you know. Although I, I was talking to my friend. The way mistaken chief about some of these names, like I, I, I would like more specific names for the snakes than pitsiksina. Pitsiksina is uh, like it sheds its skin, and it really describes all the snakes, like generically. But we could describe them um, also in in more specific ways, individual to their characteristics. This is a bull snake. It climbs trees. Um, it goes after bird nest. It, you know, most of the time here in Lethbridge, I think people find them in in uh, in and around uh, go gopher colonies or ground squirrel colonies, same as rattlesnakes. However, they seem to be able to. Uh, they seem to be able to occupy territories that are a little bit cooler in terms of south facing than some of the rattlesnake territories. And so in Lethbridge here, the bull snakes, uh, we have them on kind of the northeast side of the town and river. And on the southwest side of the town river, we have the rattlesnakes, and in between, we have a mix. This is the prairie rattlesnake, Omaxis Tixina, who are gathering at their dens at this point. And actually, because my current year is one of the odd years that I was talking about, these snakes are not gathered anymore. They're already under. Here's a look at the uh, site that I used to center my kind of going into winter and winter phenology 
observations around. It's called Cottonwood Park, but in in you know in Lethbridge, but in the old ways, it's uh, the many death place. This is uh, the confluence of the rivers of the old man and the St. Mary's where the original Fort Whoopup uh, occurred. And there's a lot of snakes here. And I originally started studying rattlesnakes. You know, this area is, ra this area is rattlesnakes um, in this park. <laughs> here you see some neonates which, like I say, in, uh, in my current year, these neonates already have happened in the previous moon. Normally, they would happen in Awakatsi Kitsum, but if you're in a strange summer where you have a, a con, like this summer, what happened was there was a, a convolution of the phenology of Patsi Kapisaki, some the frog moon, and Apistiskit, the flower moon, the things that I would expect to occur in each of those moons concurred in the first summer moon, uh, truncating the summer in a way, but allowing for latter moons that don't normally occur, like and eggs when these snakes are blind, when these babies are born. So um, this is one of the the phenological occurrences that I'm learning can happen in earlier moons during odd summers, but normally occurs in the last summer moon. At that river confluence, I have been privy to, to something uh, interesting. There was once a, a rattlesnake that had aborted several babies, and uh, I was a frequent visitor to this den, and she showed me around, really, to, to her different aborted um, the babies that didn't make it. I've seen a lot of things happen at these dens, some of which I can make some sense of and some of which I can't. You know, some of which are, are just left open questions. But one of the things that I've seen happen in multiple rattlesnake hibernacula is that Mati Kapisa, the boreal chorus frog, and uh, perhaps other terrestrial amphibians, uh, maybe even um, Ski, the tiger salamander, will winter with the snakes in the same hibernacula. You wonder, aren't they in danger? Aren't they going to get eaten by snakes going in here? In fact, you know, I've seen rattlesnakes denning with garter snakes and boreal chorus frogs, the three species at the very least, all together. And the reason they can go in together for sure is because... Uh, the snakes are cold-blooded and so they can't have anything in their stomach as they go into the brumation of winter otherwise it's going to rot they're going to get septic and die so they, they they cannot eat anything going in the question is what do these guys do when it starts to thaw um, they must have to vacate pretty quick to get away from the hungry waking reptiles. Uh, or maybe not. I don't know. But they definitely den together for the winter. Unfortunately, for Tsikatsi, and there's something with that name that I don't understand, makes elders laugh. It might be pornographic. <laughs> the grasshoppers. 
are not going to see another season. They're going to die off. This is a two-stripe grasshopper, one of our most abundant. I'll see at the end of the season. Also, the northern green striped grasshopper kind of clings to the end. The grasshopper eaters are out in abundance. These are Swanson's hawks gathering on the north end of the blood reserve. You have a lot of different birds kind of gathering for migration. Here you see a flock of, I think, red-winged blackbirds getting ready to head out. Some of the lakes near the city, you see congregations of birds beginning to come together. Mallard ducks in big numbers. Geese starting to gather. And at the pond, the beavers need to start putting their food together. This is the lunar cycle. They'll build their food cache. You can see it here. Look at the difference between the size of, uh, you can see in the kind of the foreground on the right hand side, the old beaver den that was against the edge of the wet meadows. And then you see in front of it in the water, the food cache sticking up out and then out in front, the little bit of scent mound that they used to build. Now that's their home, that scent mound. Here you see, toward the end of the moon, so much more food prepared. By this point, toward the end of the moon, you get some of the birds that are migrating out will stop at the pond. The pied-billed grebe will make an appearance. The ring-billed duck. maybe even the Western Grebe. Abatsesk means its legs go back behind. Talking about how it, its body is built. You've probably seen in my later videos, the waters of the wide South Pool are shallow this time of year. This is typical. You'll get Otakoika, the lesser yellow legs, prancing around, eating whatever kind of um, invertebrates they can find in the shallows. You get Ohkami, the great blue heron, which is featured in several of my recent videos. What I look out for are Apisoixina. Apisoixina, the rusty blackbird. Um, it's really the only time of year I see the rusty blackbird. And I remember as I, I began to become a birder much earlier in my life, the rusty blackbird was a, a, a much more frequent um, subject of my observations. Now I can barely find him and it's only as a kind of a seasonal visitor at the pond picking around on the uh, on the rocks and such in the wide south pool. Soixina means he's the water blackbird but api means kind of like the white water blackbird. Toward the end of the moon, I expect some freeze. My pond is in the shadow of the coolies. It's, it's a place that freezes early. I expect ice on the water, and with that ice on the water, this is the... the 
yellow rumped warbler. Otk, otko, otko is yellow. Otk, bach spi. It's like the yellow back. Otk, otk, bach spi. I mean, I it's it's probably talking about his yellow like tail feathers. Otk, bach spi. It almost sounds like a like a like a like when you dance with a with a with a what we call otk, bach spi. Uh, when you dance with the, uh, I can't remember the, the English word for it, but bustle, a bustle on your on your bum, hey, okay? yellow rumped warbler, shows up at the pond to eat some of the partially frozen, not in invertebrates. That you can find on the leaves in clusters like this. Yeah, I expect ice at the end of this, especially the current years, but in general, ice starts to form at my at my location. This is the last look at Xisk Stucky before the ice seals him in for the winter.